privacy knowing that IATs would collect the pieces in order that they might be decently buried. Arrived safely in Thessaly, Medea caused the death of Peleus, but Jason eventually abandoned her, and with his two sons fled to Corinth. By the end of the third act, Medea has been consumed by her desire for revenge, and in doing so, kills her two sons that she has with Jason. Nerys follows her into the temple, begging her to stop, but at her mistress' command, she is also an accomplice. Medea, however, is prey to indecision. She must have a poor revenge, but these are her children as well as Jason's. At last, all pity is purged from her heart, and the cry can be heard from those in the temple who are witnesses to Glauke's horrible death, and Medea sets off like a wild beast to complete her vengeance. Jason appears with the crowd. Nares reveals Medea's purpose. But before he can reach the entrance of the temple, Medea emerges, flanked by the three furies, and brandishing in her hand the knife with which she has killed the children. As Jason, Nares, and the crowd scatter, the temple bursts into flames, and it is Medea's ultimate revenge, as well as a showpiece for the stagehands. Carabini, generally well-received Italian composer in France, is well-known for his overtures and slightly shorter works, often very delightful in orchestration, in texture, and classical in harmonic structure. So after this rather depressing subject for a comic opera, and the cool reception of it, let's move.
combined Franco-Spanish fleet greatly outnumbered the British Mediterranean fleet, forcing the British to cede their positions in the western Mediterranean islands of Corsica and Elba. The Spanish fleet at Cartagena on the Mediterranean side was to join the French fleet at Brest. They intended to sail to Cadiz as an escort for a merchant convoy. A strong easterly wind blowing between Gibraltar and Cadiz pushed the Spanish fleet out into the Atlantic. As the winds died down, the fleet began to beat back to Cadiz. In the meantime, the British Mediterranean fleet under Admiral Sir John Jarvis in the victory, later Earl St. Vincent, had sailed from the river Tagus with ten ships of the line to try to intercept the Spanish fleet. On 6 February, Jarvis was joined off Cape St. Vincent by a reinforcement of five ships of the line, and on 11 February, the British frigate HMS Minerve, under the command of Commodore Horatio Nelson, passed through the Spanish fleet unseen thanks to heavy fog. Nelson passed the location of the Spanish fleet to Jarvis, whose squadron immediately sailed to intercept. 14 February 1797, Jarvis gave the order to form a line of battle ahead and astern of victory. When this order was completed, the British fleet had formed a single line of battle, sailing in a southerly direction on a course to pass between the two Spanish columns. To the British advantage, the Spanish fleet was formed into two groups and was unprepared for battle. While the British were already in line, Jarvis ordered the British fleet to pass between the two groups while Culloden, Blenheim, and then Prince George tacked in succession to come up on the Spanish fleet. The Spanish Lee Division now put about to Port Tack with the intention of breaking the British line at the point where the ships were tacking in succession. As the last ship in the British line passed the Spanish, the British line had formed a U-shape with Culloden in the lead and on the reverse course but chasing the rear of the Spanish. At this point, the Spanish Lee Division bore up to make an effort to join their compatriots to windward. Nelson, of the captain of 74, distinguished himself rather well in this battle, showing his prowess in action and decision-making, and bold daring in interpreting orders, capturing two enemy ships. It was great and welcome victory for the Royal Navy. Fifteen British ships had defeated a Spanish fleet, of 27. In this age of battle and revolution, of costly engagements, destruction, there was also refinement, invention, elegance, and it was in this year and in this decade that perfume and scents really began to be almost mass-produced and sold on a grand scale. It was the first mass marketing or the first production of Eau de Cologne. Eau de Cologne is a water made with a mixture of alcohol and essential oils such as citrus, be it lemon.
oils of bergamot and neroli. sanitizer. 
realize it. It's a very refreshing water. And here you see the medals it has won in Moscow, 1872. Cologne, Crown Prince Frederick Willem, Sydney, 1879. Vienna, 1873. Philadelphia, 1880, uh, 1876. And Melbourne in 1880. Some of the older bottles featured a man on a horseback numbering the factory, which you can see a little bit up in the back of the bottle. two years before this in 1795 François Rancet, whose family famous for producing perfumed gloves for French aristocracy in Grasse, France was also one of Napoleon Bonaparte's parfumiers and created for him Le Vainqueur Triomphe and L'Eau d'Ostalis for Josephine Bonaparte, he created L'Imperatrice. These were more scented than the Eau de Cologne, in which people would bathe or scent their handkerchiefs or even drink. And this particular perfuming, perfumery, Rancé, is said to have created these scents especially for Napoleon and Josephine in which when the two were together Bonaparte's scent could be detected but would not overpower Josephine's natural scent which Napoleon reportedly loved. in the following century, the 19th century, when these waters of Cologne, or Eau de Cologne, began to be more widely and widely distributed, growing in popularity and production. And Jean-Marie Joseph Farina, a grand-grand-nephew of the Giovanni Maria Farina, who operated in Cologne, opened a perfumery business in Paris in the early 19th century that was later sold to Roger Gallet. And it produces the Eau de Cologne Extra Vieille. And like many of the waters, its notes are similar. Amalfi lemon, bergamot, orange, mandarin, rosemary, neroli, clove, myrtle, cedar musk, white amber, and sandalwood. And you can see, if you've watched my video on the French East India Company, how these oils and spices and scents began to travel around Europe and become sought-after commodities. By the 1860s, another Eau de Cologne was launched with very similar notes. This one was by Pierre-François Pascal Guerlain, and it's called Eau de Cologne. Imperial. This one is said to have been used by Empress Eugenie as a remedy for a migraine. And this one, like all the waters, the refreshing waters of Cologne, has citrus notes, 
neroli, lemon, verbena, bergamot, and orange, over base notes of rosemary, cedar, and donka bean. We can insert a bit of romance into 1797. It is well known that Napoleon Bonaparte was very in love with Josephine de Beauharnais, and after their marriage, he wrote her prolifically from the battlefront and his campaign. I will read a few excerpts from his letters. To Josephine at Bologna, Ancona, February 10th, 1797. We have been at Ancona these two days. We took the citadel after a slight fusillade, and by a coup de main, we made twelve hundred prisoners. I sent back the fifty officers to their homes. I do not press you to come, because everything is not yet settled. But in a few days, I am hoping that it will be. Besides, this country is still discontented, and everybody is nervous. I start tomorrow for the mountains. You don't write to me at all, yet you ought to let me have news of you. I send you a million kisses. I never was so sick of anything as of this vile war. Goodbye, my darling. Think of me. Bonaparte. Ancona, February 13th, 1797. I start immediately to cross the mountains. The moment that I know something definite, I will arrange for you to accompany me. It is the dearest wish of my heart. A thousand and a thousand kisses. Write to me. Think of me. Love me. Yours ever for life. Bonaparte. February 16th, 1797. Please take care of yourself. Love me as much as I love you. And write to me every day. I have told Muscati to escort you to Ancona, if you care to come there. I will write to you there, to let you know where I am. Perhaps I shall make peace with the Pope. Then I shall soon be by your side. It is my soul's most ardent wish. I send you a hundred kisses. Be sure that nothing equals my love. Write to me every day of yourself. Goodbye, dearest. Bonaparte. February 19th, the Peace of Tolentino, with the Pope, who has to pay for his equivocal attitude and broken treaty. To Josephine at Bologna, Tolentino, February 19th, 1797. Peace with Rome has just been signed. Bologna, Ferrata, Romagna are ceded to the Republic. The Pope is to pay us thirty millions shortly, and various works of art. I start tomorrow for mourning for Ancona, and thence for Rimini, Ravenna, and Bologna. If your health permit, come to Rimini or Ravenna. Not a word from you. What on earth have I done? To think only of you, to love only Josephine, to live only for my wife. To enjoy happiness only with my dear one, does this deserve such harsh treatment from her? My dear, I beg you, think often of me, and write to me every day. You, to whom nature has given intelligence, tenderness, and beauty, you who alone can rule my heart, you who doubtless know only too well the unlimited power you hold over me, Bonaparte. 1797 was the second presidential election of the United States of America. During that election, John Adams was elected president and Thomas Jefferson was vice president. We're going to have a look at a letter this letter was written from by Thomas Jefferson to Adams, to John Adams. These two remained friends, though they had their troubles for most of their lives. 
This letter was never received by John Adams. It was enclosed, unsealed, by Thomas Jefferson in his letter to James Madison, dated January 1st, 1797, with this request. The papers, by the last post, which included Madison's letter of December 19th, 1796, which we will read, not rendering it necessary to change anything in the letter, I enclose it open for your perusal, not only that you may possess the actual state of dispositions between us, but that if anything should render the delivery of it ineligible in your opinion, you may return it to me. But Madison never delivered this letter to John Adams. Dear Sir, the public and the public papers have been much occupied lately in placing us in a point of opposition to each other. I trust with confidence that less of it has been felt by ourselves personally. In the retired canton where I am, I learn little of what is passing. And he closes. I devoutly wish you may be able to shun for us this war by which our agriculture, commerce, and credit will be destroyed. If you are, the glory will be all your own, and that your administration may be filled with glory and happiness to yourself and advantage to us is the sincere wish of one who, though in the course of our voyage through life, Various little incidents have happened, or been contrived to separate us, retains still for you the solid esteem of the moments when we were working for our independence, and sentiments of respect and affectionate attachment. Thomas Jefferson. So this closes our survey of a few very significant events of the year 1797. If there are any events which you particularly enjoyed and would like to hear more about, please leave it in the comments. It is probably worth doing a video on the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, as the maneuvers are quite extraordinary. In the meantime, I hope you've relaxed and enjoyed the sounds, the whispers, the history, that you remember to be good to yourself. 